I think at this point it's probably a known fact by now that I am a huge Mega Man fan. I mean in case you couldn't tell that by now after playing and reviewing 4 games now on this channel of the X series that I totally recommend watching as well as geeking about Battle Network as of recent with the release of the Legacy Collection, I think it's a pretty safe assumption that I love the Blue Bomber so damn much no matter the rendition and even if things do start to decline as we continue on with the X franchise here. And what better way to talk about this decline with the discussion of Mega Man X5 where things things do start to take a rather interesting turn for the franchise for better and for worse oh boy you know to be quite honest here it is pretty cool to go and continue on with this Mega Man X journey with all you guys here because clearly the train is not stopping anytime soon because today we gotta tackle Mega Man X5 a game that a lot of people have some personal attachments to however I don't given that I've spent most of my time playing Mega Man X1 on the SNES Mega Man X4 of course and Mega Man X6 which is the next entry that we're gonna be tackling after this one and that is definitely gonna be near like that that is so close down the line and I I am just a little bit frightful about that. Continuing further down that Mega Man X rabbit hole now, of course at some point we would be reaching the later half of the franchise here and many Mega Man fans know that this is where the ship of the X series starts to sink slowly to rock bottom for the Blue Bomber unfortunately, all thanks to Mega Man X5 here which is often regarded by many in the fan base as mediocre at best. I mean it's not bad but it's not good either. Already speaking about its reception here, I can definitely understand why so many people, including myself, don't have an immediate satisfaction with this particular entry, especially with how much love and admiration Mega Man X4 holds to this very day. And I'm not even joking there, everybody loves this game so damn much, and there's plenty of good reason behind why. But with Mega Man X5, things do start to feel a bit off, but it's an off that requires at least some level of context behind why this game is regarded as a mixed bag at best. Best. And to find that said context, we gotta go all the way to 2000 baby, hell yeah! The year 2000 was where I can say looking back it's the era where the gaming industry was at its most intriguing as it was the year where the transition to new hardware was slowly starting to take shape. Sure it wouldn't be about a year or two later, but this year in particular was basically a limbo state for most consoles at the time. The Nintendo 64 was somewhat thriving having just released Majora's Mask before its inevitable transition to the GameCube. The Xbox wasn't ready, nor the PS2 for that matter, and in the context of the PlayStation 1 here, things just seemed to be alright, but clearly it showed that it was the end of an era here for this generation of consoles. Plus, we also gotta be real here, the PlayStation 1 was, was absolutely dominating here, they, they really needed that break. And it was in that limbo state where Capcom decided to say, hey, why don't we just make one more entry to the X series here, to which the result ended up being Mega Man X5, releasing in November 30th of 2000 for the PlayStation 1 exclusively. Yeah, there's no Sega Saturn release this time around like in Mega Man X4, mainly due to the fact that it was the Dreamcast time to shine and Capcom most likely felt that a Resident Evil game would just fit that console better than the Blue Bomber himself. Plus Capcom, if you're ever watching this video, please give us a Code Veronica remake. I think it's high time, you know? Not only that, but it also seemed that it would be the final product of Keiji Inafune regarding the series as a whole, as he felt that he wanted to take a break from the Mega Man X franchise and work on his own projects, that of course being the infamous Mega Man Zero series on the GBA two years later. And then we kinda all know what happened later on with the franchise and it hasn't really recovered since. But despite our talks for what the future of the X series provides, you can't deny the feeling of finality that this game presents, and that's the one thing I would like to immediately point out here before moving on. Everything that this game presents, be it its presentation, the opening cinematic, to the music and stage gimmicks, it seems that Capcom was pulling so many things from the previous games as well as the original series for that matter as a means to bring about that conclusion to the franchise here. We will talk more about this later on in the video, don't worry about that, just wanted to throw this detail out here because it's definitely felt that way looking back. Look, I know I'm teasing you guys a lot with that intro and overview alone, so now I think it's finally time to properly dive into Mega Man X5 here and see what the original conclusion was meant to be with Mega Man X here, Zero, and all the gang involved in this plot against their final fight with Sigma here because yeah, bro be back like he's Palpatine from Episode 9 in Star Wars. 
Oh, who's that guy with the pink shaders? He looks like an important character. Mega Man X5 starts us off immediately with Sigma ready to take action against the Maverick Hunters as he decided to attack X and Zero in a nearby city population, to which the two answer and react accordingly. I mean, it's been four games already that they've dealt with the evil Buzz Lightyear, but hey now, no complaints. But then it seems that it was actually a part of Sigma's plans to lure X and Zero all along as not only after his defeat, a virus is scattered throughout the entire Earth, known as the Sigma virus, affecting not only Reploids, but also human in the process and on top of that sigma hired a hitman by the name of dynamo who would then take the eurasia space colony as hostage and have it collide with the earth within 16 hours as a means to further escalate the situation on the maverick hunter side holy hell sigma you're not really playing around here all right buddy i get it with the stage presented now it is up to our trusty maverick hunters to once again stop sigma's plans only this time around they're gonna need some additional help you got alia for mission report where she will never shut the hell up every five seconds despite being one of my favorite female Mega Man characters. You have Douglas who is in charge of the parts system this game has, allowing you additional benefits for platforming and combat. And lastly, Cygnus, the head of command who tasks X and Zero to gather parts for a cannon known as the Enigma to fire at the space colony and save the entire Earth. Also, by the way, was I the only one who thought Cygnus was going to be Sigmas and he was in disguise and there was going to be like a huge plot twist during the course of the game? Or was that really just my dumb brain back in the day? And as a means to gather all these parts for the Enigma cannon, there are four specific Mavericks to face off. And from here, the game pretty much becomes familiar as it is a regular Mega Man X game moving forward. Power-ups, hard tanks, and armor parts are back for X and Zero. And it's what you know from the previous games as well. So you just run and gun your way to the end and retrieve those parts, baby. Let's Let's go! What's even cool about this game particularly is that for these set of Mavericks, they have the most unique names out of the entire franchise as well. Like you got this big robot bear named Grizzly Slash that is just... Wait, what? Oh yeah, that's right. You see here in the Legacy Collection here, they decided to remove the Guns N' Roses reference that was in the original Western release back in the PS1. Why did they do that here? I honestly don't even know, but what a fumble, Capcom. So a little bit of context here for those who don't know what the hell I'm talking about here, but Alison Court, who voiced Claire Redfield, the original Resident Evil 2, was also the English translator for Mega Man X5. And at the time, her ex-husband was a big Guns N' Roses fan and decided, hey, why don't we just rename the Mavericks for this game as such? And the result, I'm telling you, was just freaking incredible. Like, Gr Crescent Grizzly was Grizzly Slash, Spiral Pegasus was the Skyver, Spike Rose Red was Axel the Rose, and Tidal Whale was Duff McWhale, and God Capcom, why did you remove these from the Legacy Collection? They sounded so damn cool! Look, I get it, this is a personal pet peeve of mine. Look, I grew up playing the X Collection on the GameCube, and they had this reference here, that's how I know it that's where a lot of people know it and it just sucks to see that this was a missed opportunity for a lot of people that are experiencing these games for the very first time on the legacy collection and are missing out on this little tidbit here to jump straight into some gameplay in the meantime, Mega Man X5 is the same as before, so I won't really stress too much about the gameplay aspect, minus the things that it did on top of that in order to stand out as the fifth entry. After all, once you hit that fifth number, especially in a platformer of all things, things may start to feel a little bit stale, and since I am playing these games back to back, yeah, you dudes are to see the crack, so to speak. Much like Mega Man X4, you get the option to choose between X and Zero from the start of the game, but the difference here as opposed to X4 is that no matter who you end up choosing, you can still choose between the two characters throughout the course of your playthrough. <laughs> Talk about the illusion of free choice, am I right? Basically, X and Zero are both playable from the start of the game until the very end, but it's also equally important to understand that even if you do choose one over the other at the start of the game, each one does come with their own set of advantages and disadvantages. For X's campaign, you start the game with the entire 4th armor set from the previous game, already giving you an additional armor set along with the other 3 you get to unlock in this game as well. You got the added perks from the get go baby, minus the bug of infinite ammo for special weapons, and you get to play the game normally from there. With Zero, if you do choose him to start the game with, you earn the perk of the Z Buster, which is now his long range weapon for his arsenal this go around. It's not great compared to X's Buster since it doesn't have a charge feature, but for those looking to add some new ways to play as Zero, 
and it does get the job done to some degree, I'll admit. But there is a consequence for choosing Zero and earning the Z-Buster as it results in X losing out on his entire 4th armor set, adding a nerf to X's side of things. Now, if you wanted a Zero-only route experience, then this is no problem, but trust me for those that are looking to swap between X and Zero in your playthroughs, then choose X as your default and use Zero afterwards. The Z-Buster may look cool and all, but I wouldn't rely it on for proper gameplay here because it's so pathetic compared to X's Buster. Stick with what you know with the Red Swordsman back in X4 and leave it be. Overall, in these side of things, we'll talk more about it down the line, but essentially you're gonna find yourself feeling rather comfortable, and as someone who is playing this immediately after finishing Mayhem X4, this is a statement I hold true and shows that there was a level of care in sticking with their guns and allowing the gameplay to speak for itself. But there is one thing that I do have to tell you in regards to the gameplay aspect that just kinda hurts my soul, both as a Mega Man fan kind of as a platformer enjoyer period. So for those that own the Legacy Collection nowadays, Capcom gave us the option to play the game in Rookie Hunter mode, where it makes the game easier in quotations as you take less damage from boss fights and you're somewhat immune to spikes. Now I used this for Mega Man X3 back in its review mainly because of the level design and stage layouts, and the same sadly holds true in this case too. I know, I get it, I am a total fraud in Mega Man games, but trust me when I say that this game has some of the most weird weirdest choices for level design that somehow makes Mega Man X3 feel like a saint sometimes. We'll talk more about the ups and downs of X5's gameplay in just a little bit here, don't worry about that. I just wanted to throw the basics more or less before moving on with the story here because we're clearly not done talking about that, am I right? Lo and behold, you beat the four Mavericks that you need to get to pieces of the Enigma Cannon from, and from here is where things start to take a very funny approach in its storyline, and by funny, did I really mean to say annoying? Alright, so depending on your luck, you have the chances of the Enigma Cannon firing at the Space Colony and successfully hitting it, resulting in gaining access to the final area early on, or you could also miss the Space Colony entirely and have it hit about 60% of it, which the latter will occur way more than the former. Like, dude, okay now, you have no idea how many times I had to reset the game in order to see if my probabilities were right in this, and I kid you not, no matter how many times you reset the game to this safe point, the result will end up being the same in missing the space colony, and trust me, if you also happen to think that, oh, why not try the rookie hunter mode to see if things are easier on the legacy collection, then no. You're absolutely dead wrong because it's gonna do the same thing no matter what. Trust me, you are not winning this fight on probability no matter how many times you're gonna reset the game to see if the damn thing actually works, okay? But hey, hope is not all lost yet as despite the failed attempts at destroying the colony, it has shifted off its course a little bit and as a backup plan, a space shuttle is required to use as a missile to fully get the job done. So from here, you proceed to fight the next four Mavericks needed to get the right pieces up for the space shuttle to then have Zero get strapped in since there is no autopilot for some bizarre reason and finish the job from there. Or so you would think. You see, in reality, much like the Enigma Cannon, the Space Shuttle will also result in the same thing. You either get the job done by getting Zero to the Space Shuttle and destroy it completely, or also fail and have Zero suddenly engulfed by both the Sigma Virus and a new virus called the Zero Virus that then requires X to snap him out of his senses and then proceed to fight Sigma from there. And here... Here's where I knew that something was completely off with Mega Man X5. If for some reason you never managed to hit the Enigma properly and failed to get Zero out of there from the space shuttle, then this just means you lost an entire character to use for the endgame, and if you decided to play as Zero through most of the adventure, then this also means the progress you made with him is completely gone, leaving with you and X and its little upgrades you decided to give him, which just sucks man, it entirely blows the idea even using both characters in the first place. And for those that enjoyed playing as Zero in the previous game, as in me right here, this also loses the sentiment of wanting to play as him and then obviously I gotta hope for the best, because if luck determines the fate of if I get to play as my favorite character for the end game, then I gotta consider that to be really bad game design as it ruins the incentive of even having the character playable in the first place, especially if I have to restart the game another 30 times to do so. Again, why did you do this Capcom? I don't get it! But of course, no matter what happens, X and Zero finally duke it out as it was teased back and Mayo X3, god finally, I've been waiting for this damn moment all my life and now it's finally being resolved here, though it's mainly due to the circumstances of a literal viral outbreak happening and claims one or the other to be a maverick. Regardless of what the reasoning happens to be, the two finally fight only to get their asses beat and then Sigma intervening to say hey, I'm back motherfuckers 
as if that wasn't a thing since the beginning of the game. On top of all that, Sigma returns, says his usual villainy spiel, then gets his ass beat even after turning into a giant mech with hands to throw quite literally, and because of the explosion in the process, Zero goes out of commission yet again to deliver the final blow to Sigma here, and then X, who was also caught in the debris of the thing, is saved from Dr. Light for some bizarre reason, because of course he is, and now we jump to three years later in the epilogue where X is back on his two feet, ready to take action, and now wield his friend's trusty Z Zaver to battle. Wait, that, wait, how the hell did he even get that in the first place? So yeah, as you can see here, I really didn't care about the story for this one. I mean, not to the degree as I felt was needed after all, since again, this is a Mega Man game. Who the hell plays this for the story? But okay, fine, if you want to learn more about the endgame portion of this game story, we can backtrack a little bit and we can dissect some of the contents here. For one, I do like the aspect of the game presenting in some way a more dire situation compared to Mega Man X4's. As I complained back in X4 where the situation could have easily been resolved between X0 and the Repliforce, here in X5, the matter is so severe that there does seem to be a hope is all lost scenario taking place. I quite like this a lot and it definitely shows the mature elements of the X series, but quite a larger margin when compared to the previous games. Secondly, throughout the course of the game itself, there is a lot that we start to learn more in terms of both X and Zero as Reploids, Zero especially as they further elaborate on his backstory that was also presented back in Mega Man X4. You see, while Reploids and humans are being affected by the Sigma virus in a more negative way, causing them to go corrupt in the bunch, it seems that in Zero's case, he starts to react to it in a more positive manner, resulting in him getting stronger because of it. Now, one would think that something is wrong with Zero, which logically speaking that could be the case, as does him and the lifesaver that diagnosed him, but in actuality is much more important to the plot of X5 as a whole. It turns out that as Sigma was planning to invade the world with his virus, he also wanted to make sure that he could lure out Zero in the process after learning more about him as a Reploid. In the process of doing so, the game kind of mentions this but doesn't really have the specificities as to how, Sigma also lets X and Zero know that he managed to come in contact with the manufacturer of Zero, which we all know for many Mega Man fans out there, it turns out to be Dr. Wily by the end of it. Now, as for how he managed to speak with the dude entirely, I don't even know. We're talking about the same series where we see Dr. Light in a time capsule of sorts and somehow knows what is going on in the world around him before giving you the armor parts. So honestly, I don't really care. Oh yeah, about those. The armor parts are here to collect once again, but unlike the previous games where you get to use the benefits once you enter the capsules, in X5 and by extension X6, Dr. Light decided that for the safety of X here, he will lock the perks until the entire armor set is completed. And while many people groan at this thought and want to use the armor parts there and then, I feel quite indifferent to this in all honesty. I mean, you have the entire fourth armor set if you choose X first from the start of the game, so why really complain about this minor inconvenience? Now, out of the two armors, three, if you don't use the cheat code for it and wait until like the last second to get the ultimate armor, these armors are pretty solid for this game at least. Now you got the Falcon armor where it may have a weak charge shot, it has the added bonus of defense and a glide ability that also acts as a shield. Like X is invulnerable to anything as he flies and it helps for some of the more vertical platforming if you need it. It's a neat armor that gets the job done and that's pretty cool in the end for this entry, though not as cool as the fourth armor, but easily one of my top five in terms of X's armor sets. Next we got the Gaia armor where this one I don't really care as much as the Falcon armor, but its main gimmick is spike immunity, which is pretty neat, man. This means you just slap the blue bomber with this armor and he can walk around and touch spikes without dying, and that's pretty amazing for this game, though. It is a shame he's slow in this armor, but it works for those sections where you need to get a hard tank or two, or for one of the final stages where they just love to throw those spikes like it's on free real estate. Sheesh. And it even makes fighting the boss of that stage a whole lot easier. Haha, <laughs> what are you gonna do now, huh, Rang the Banga? Why, yes, that is its name. Like I said before, these armors, while they work fine for this game, I am completely indifferent to them. However, despite my indifference, I gotta say, I really do enjoy their debut, and for the Falcon armor especially, I definitely value its utility a whole lot more now. But then you also got the ultimate armor for this game too near the end of the game, and if you just didn't put the cheat code for it like I mentioned, then everything I said becomes null and void entirely. God, the ultimate armor is just so cool, man. What I did care to see the most was the faded battle happening that was being teased surrounding both X and Zero, and no matter what the result ends up being with Zero, the fight still happens, and it's one of, dare I say, the coolest fights you'll ever have to even grace the entire Mega Man franchise. I'm not even kidding, nothing tops this fight 
fight. And the only one I can think of that could would be the Omega fight in Mega Man Zero 3. That happens way later in the timeline. And also, funny enough, happens to involve Zero. So yeah, every single time you have Zero and a boss fight, it's going to be epic. Just going to say that right now. Besides all of that, though, the story is just somewhat of a mixed reception. And Shocker 2, am I right? I mean, I did say that more or less in the beginning of the video. And here I am reiterating that point. As a whole, Mega Man X5 story doesn't feel well earned as a so-called conclusion to the franchise with all the garbage that it has on top of it, and I can understand that with this sentiment, Capcom decided to continue working on the X franchise without the input of Inefune, this why Inefune clearly wanting this game to be the end of the X series just so he could focus on other projects. Yet, regardless of how I feel of the conclusion for this game, you can still see that there was a tone of finality in the end. With the stage designs for example, you see a lot from the previous games making a return in terms of gimmicks, traps, and enemy designs. Enemies from the SNES trilogy and X4 return, some stage features as well, and the music does add some remixes from those games too to allow a sense of that familiarity and nuance of the events of the game unfolding. And god, the music for this entry, by and large one of the best things about this game as I am just so filled with joy every time I'm hearing the emphasis of heavy rock being thrown into the fray here. Stage themes are so enriched with that focus of ensuring that wherever you go, there's that dire situation present, especially as you fight the Mavericks themselves where the music makes it abundantly clear that these Mavericks are not to be messed around with, especially since they aren't Mavericks to begin with. So yeah, in X5, if you bother to read through the dialogue before fighting each of the Mavericks, some make it well known that it was destiny that brought them to fight given the circumstances of the Sigma virus affecting them. They ask to basically be put down and out of their misery so that they are not branded officially as Mavericks, and that's pretty tragic to see in all honesty. It's like Doppler Town from Mega Man X3 but on a massive global scale, all thanks to a bald man who had a raging hard on for a red and blue robot. Also, extra bonus points on that Sigma final boss stage because wow, that they, they really proved their worth on that one. Despite all these positives, however, there are of course a lot of negative ones, or really mediocre approaches to the gameplay design here as it's not all bad, but it definitely feels a bit lackluster when you start to sit through it multiple times. While I did say that gameplay is not much different than Mega Man X4 or the previous games in structure, the layout and emphasis on other add-ons are what makes or breaks the X5 experience, and in my case, it definitely made me appreciate X3 a whole lot more now, that's for sure, and you never ever want to give praise to Mega Man X3. One major critique I will throw right off the bat with Mega Man X5 here is the pacing. And the pacing, man, god, why can't Alia shut the hell up? Every time you're busy going through the stages, Alia just stops in your tracks to talk for two minutes about the stage, and it just ruins the entire flow of rushing through the stage and going through the motions. In these sections, just fast forward the dialogue because trust me, there's nothing of value of them, and it's just a waste of time. Like, it really is. But to go back to the gameplay with X or Zero here, while they are fine in retrospect, it seems that after replaying the game numerous times as Zero off screen, it feels like X5 just works better as a Zero only experience. I mean, there's nothing wrong with playing as X, as seen with the footage recorded, but with how the formatting of the game feels, it just seems that Zero works better in the long run. He still has his arsenal like before, much like X gets with his special weapons, and he is just a better experience overall. And speaking of the special weapons, they're fine, I guess. I mean, I mainly use them for Maverick bosses because their utility in this game was not as great as X4's. And again, Zero just takes the cake because of his special abilities. But with X, nah, just stick with the X Buster. And then of course you got the E tanks and the heart tanks to collect here as before, that's pretty much standard, but in regards to the heart tanks in this experience, you not only collect heart tanks through the stages as before, but if you rescue enough reploids scattered about in certain stages, they grant you what's known as a life up upgrade, counting as a heart tank in the process and resulting in 16 heart tanks to collect total. See now, I would say in this regard, hell yeah, this is pretty awesome, but here's a small caveat to that, because you see, with the life up upgrade, this means that you have to choose carefully who you play as, because in this game, both X and Zero do not have a share life bar system, so whatever one ends up grabbing, the other one loses out on, so it is essentially a balancing act in terms of who gets what, if you want to switch between the two of them, or you could just grab them all for yourself in one go and move on with your day, which honestly is just a better approach here. Additionally, 
Additionally, Aelia gives you the option between weapons and life or weapons and energy, the former augmenting your life bar and the latter augmenting your special weapons meter, which I guess further adds that level of balance in terms of who gets the benefits. Why they wanted this to be a system in the first place, I don't even know, but it's not something that I can comfortably say is the best way to tackle a Mega Man X game. Stage design feels weird here too, like you have certain stages that are phenomenal and have a unique gimmick on top of them for the first act and then towards the second act of them, they just fumbled the bag hard that at certain points it felt either stressful or just so ridiculous that I just didn't want to touch the game at all. Like you have Grizzly Slash's stage here for example, being similar to Slash Beast where you're on top of a moving vehicle and the design for this level in particular is quite solid. It has the challenge you want out of an X game, some enemies to avoid an attack, and something to really look forward to by the end of it. The same with Izzy Glow and how it's a play on Split Mushroom's level design progression where you're entering the makings of a castle that was turned into a laboratory by a mad firefly. Okay, now that is just both funny and awesome to say out loud now that I think about it. But then you have Duff McWhale in stage being this entire underwater segment where a giant robot fish is after you and you are avoiding enemies while also being in this somewhat claustrophobic situation that I do not like on top of the water physics in place. It is such a slow paced level for a Mega Man X game that is built for that fast paced run and gun element. And then you have the Matter X where you have this neat lava trap where you need to hide in this little cubby of sorts and wait for when the time is right and then in the second act you have to choose between the right armor and head down to the lava pits themselves or go upwards and face such intense rope grabbing platforming that is not fun along with this robot pterodactyl get away from me shoo be gone be gone from here. The same is said with Axel the Rosa stage where they just throw you into a spike wall galore in tight rope sections as well as a random bottomless pit scenario with no leeway if you get screwed over and you will get screwed over with its enemy placement as well. And knowing this firsthand, I immediately switched to the Falcon armor for that invisible glide to help with those sections but still man, they just didn't even know what to do with this stage. And don't even get me started with Squid Adler stage and how it begins. Okay, but what the fuck? This is really just scratching the surface in terms of stage design because on the one hand, I can completely find fault in myself for not being careful in certain segments as I do sometimes play my Mega Man games a bit recklessly. But on the other, even if I do play the game carefully, there will still be some design flaw BS that will get the best of me no matter what I do to try to avoid it, further crutching Mega Man X5's overall level design. Boss fights in X5 are quite fun to engage in, at least if you're not using the weakness for them with the special weapons where they go down without even trying, and they even add a level of difficulty that normally wasn't there from the previous games. Now, if this was needed, I cannot honestly tell you, but they do deliver the punch and they provide what is needed in the end and makes these set of Mavericks all the more interesting in combat. Oh, and also Dynamo exists in this game too, acting as like a mid-boss round that kinda doesn't feel right and rewarding and further ruins the whole pacing of the game because now he's shows up and says peace out as he had some real relevancy to the plot here. Still a badass character and music slaps for his encounter, but eh, it's nothing extra here. To briefly go back to what I said about the dialogue of these Mavericks, I like how they recall certain moments from the past such as the Repla Force's history with Hunter HQ, Launch Octopus being brought up in Squid Adler's encounter, and with Zero specifically, the constant allusion to him being a Maverick in the past and how strong he can be with a virus that is currently spreading around. This to me enhances what X4 did in terms of story building, just without the need of having animated cutscenes attached to them, though I will say this. Having to hear that stupid ping every three seconds when reading the dialogue was not the right call, Capcom. What the hell was that decision? On top of that, remember when I said that this game paid homage to not only the previous games, but also the original series for that matter? Well, they do that in the later half of the game, mainly in the last few stages to get to the final boss, but what they chose to pay homage to is what really screws X5 a lot in the end regarding that aforementioned stage design. Alright, starting the final level's first stage, and already we are greeted to Quick Man's Laser Trash from Mega Man 2. Well, now I see where this is going. Straight to hell, I see. Oh great, there's even the Shadow Devil as a boss fight, being annoying as always, much like the original series, the annoying vertical spike placements in the second final stage, the Bubble Man stage design, as well as the disappearing box in the Sigma stage, and of course, Rang the Banga, as I mentioned from Mega Man X1, also being a menace here as well. That is just neat here, again. Thank god for the Gaia armor here, because all of this and the difficulty in this game without it, oh man, I am just feeling it right now.
Aside from all that, that's honestly about it in terms of stages and the homages to the past. I mean, I can point you to a video or two where it does go more into an in-depth analysis in this. I don't mind it, but like I said already, Mega Man X5 just makes me feel indifferent at the end of the day. And look, when a game is bad, a game is bad, and we can all point a lot of fingers at some games with this perspective. There's no denying that subjective truth. To some, this is a bad game, and I totally understand that. But it's also important to understand that for me personally, Mega Man X5 is a game that just exists within the Mega Man X franchise as it did what it could with the established framework from the past to try and keep the momentum forward for the X series, but sadly not by much. Essentially, what you have here with X5 is that it is a game and entry to the X franchise that doesn't feel like a proper conclusion. While the intention of this game being the last of the X series and then move on to the next Blue Bomber subseries, be it the Legends franchise or Mega Man Zero on the GBA, was prominent back then, now in hindsight, X5 feels like a mediocre mix reception that yeah, it gets the job done, but it loses a lot of value that could have made it way better. Everything about this game just makes me feel both excited and unsatisfied in terms of what it presented, and it's no wonder why whenever I want to play the Mega Man X franchise, I always leave X5 as one of the last ones to deal with because I just can't enjoy it to the fullest. While there are some positives in this game as I mentioned throughout the course of this video, the negative ones just out wait a whole lot more in the end. Though I am still very glad they gave us that X vs Zero fight, I am not complaining about that one bit. For now though, I hope you guys are really enjoying the revisits that I've been doing lately with the X franchise and let me know other video games that you want me to cover in the future because I do want to talk a little bit more, you know, there was Tears of the Kingdom, I did my first impressions on that already and I am really playing that game a lot, like that is a really really good game. But in terms of Mega Man stuff, I know Battle Network again, major major comeback, I did my annual bring give us Mega Man Legends 3 spiel already so in terms of Mega Man we're just gonna continue riding the waves with the X franchise for now and the next game like I teased already is Mega Man X6 which I'm, I'm not really ready for that game I like please like 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 I said it, it only goes downhill from here I am not mentally prepared with that I just I, I just really really want to enjoy this franchise as best as I can